we know that in our world economy today, some things have gotten more expensive as time was went on. Amen? And it sure shows when you go to the grocery store or the gas station, you begin to feel the cost of inflation. You begin to see that um, some things are just costing more, whether it's groceries or, or gasoline or Sometimes energy is costing more. I don't know. I got my electric bill the other day, and I thought, hmm, I think it's went up like gas. And so, um, in fact, I wondered if they were running my house on gasoline <laughs> or something. But at any rate, it seems that the cost of things have gotten higher. I didn't do this, but it might be a good exercise for us to go back and look up the cost of things the year you were born, right? And just say, my goodness, how things might have changed. You know, I saw a little thing on Facebook, and it had listed the cost of automobiles. And um, there was uh, some automobiles in there listed, a Ford truck and a Mustang, and nothing was over $3,000. It was all like two twenty five hundred dollars <laughs> I was thinking, goodness gracious, look how things have changed, right? But there are some things that have stayed the same. There are some things that the cost has remained the same. Uh, not many, but there are a, are a few. One in particular is the cost that it requires to pay for our sin. The cost of that has always been really, really steep. In the Old Testament, there was never a uh, fully uh, way to pay for sin. When we read the Old Testament, we find that... Um, they would bring a lamb or a bull or a goat, and they would bring it to the, the place they were supposed to come, whether it be the temple or the tabernacle, or early on it was a family worship, and they would offer this animal, and, and this animal would never pay for sin. It would always atone, which is called a covering. And so if you could think about maybe, you know, if you had a bad spot in your floor at home, and you just said, well, let's get a big rug, and there you go. It covers it. Nobody knows anything. A life goes on, right? And then maybe... You know, you pull the rug up and you're like, oh, I forgot about that bad spot. It's always going to be there until it gets fixed. In the New Testament, Jesus is the one that actually pays for sin. The, it's not a, a sacrifice like an animal. It is totally different. And he gives his life. The price for sin has always, always been more than we can afford. I know you may go to the, the, the store and you may think, I can't afford this anymore, right? I can't afford. We bought something the other day and my wife said, those taste just as good as the name brand. And I, she said, they're half the price. I said, that's my kind of deal, right? We're buying that from now on. We can't afford to eat the other one anymore. We're, you know, I would rather have something that tasted similar as nothing at all, amen? And so you say, well, I, I, I understand and I get that. But when it comes to the price to redeeming our soul, we've never had the currency to do that. We don't have a bank account big enough. We can't draw out of our works enough to pay for that. We cannot look at God and say, I'm good enough, take this as a payment, and that work. There's nothing you can offer to God to pay for your own sin. Now that is a struggling concept for a people, us, that we seem pretty self-sufficient, right? I mean, we kind of say, you know, it's our spirit within us. If it's not, you know, if it's hard, just dig in and make it happen, right? If, it's, if it seems impossible, then achieve the impossible. Go after it. We kind of have that spirit within us, right? You can do great things, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when it comes to sin, when it comes to our moral condition before a holy, righteous God, there's nothing a good speech going to do to get you over that. There's nothing that education can prepare you or a training or an online course or watching a YouTube video that's going to say, here's how to pay for your sin. There's only one way through that. There's only one way through that. Now, Isaiah, the prophet, is writing... 700 years prior to the death of Christ. So if you have your Bible today, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 53. We've been spending some time working through 
this chapter. It is filled with graphic details about how the Messiah, God's chosen one, would come and suffer for you and for me. It is given in such description that it's almost like, is this written the day after the, res- the crucifixion and the resurrection? I mean, is this written in Jesus' day or is this written in Isaiah's day? It is, it is not just a, a, a fact that's before you today, but it is a provable, provable historical fact that Isaiah wrote his book 700 years before the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. And so what am I saying today? Well, what I'm saying is God had laid it before the people that would search after him, that would read his word, that was going to be one that was going to die for sin. We're going to see that today. We're going to see a a glimmer, a little glimmer, a little hope of resurrection in this today. We're also going to see a glimmer of, of not only resurrection, but what we would refer to as heaven in this passage today. It is a good thing to be here today. Listen, it's good that you're tuning in to God's Word here today. God, let me say, if you want it today, God's going to feed you. Amen? I'm just, I'm perfectly, it has nothing to do with me. It has very little to do with me. I honestly think I could walk out of here. I'm not going to do that. But I could walk out of here and just let you sit here and read these verses. And you go, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. But I want to help you. I think God's called me to help you understand God's Word. So we're going to read it together. As verse 10, 11, and 12, I want to ask you to honor God's word and stand in reverence for his word today. The Bible says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his head. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Father, today, help us understand, appreciate, know, and apply this word to our life. God, I thank you that we have this opportunity to study your word today. God, would you grow our hearts Make us understand, God, enlighten us so that we walk out of here, walk away today different in your presence, in your spirit, through your grace, by your word. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for reading God's word with me this morning. It's great to to hear that, great to see that. We are grateful that God has got us in this word, and we understand that there are some things going on here. This may be... One of the hardest verses to understand in Scripture. These set of verses are hard for me personally to get my mind around. When I read verse 10 and I see that it pleased the Lord to bruise him, my mind kind of goes in to neutral. I I just kind of have to stop and I go, it pleased the Lord, to bruise him. What that is saying, what that, the Lord there is God the Father. That is capital L-O-R-D in your Bible. That is Yahweh. That is covenant God of the Old Testament. That is the God that spoke out of the bush to Moses. That is the God that promises to Israel to declare to them. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Who's the him? That is Jesus. There is There is something going on here that it says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now, as I talked a minute ago about the cost of living and the cost of living is going up, I will say this, the cost of dying is even greater. The cost of living is pretty high. And I'm not talking about your funeral expenses either. 
I'm saying if you die without Christ, the cost of living is really, really high. I would rather have Jesus atone and pay for my sin, right? I would rather have him pay for my sin in this life than me die without Christ and go into the next life and me spend eternity paying for my sins and for eternity. But I'm telling you right now, I want to point out a few things from this passage and this hope today. And the first one I'll point out is the cost of the Father loving you. The cost of the Father loving you. And I'm not talking about your earthly father today. I'm talking about the heavenly father. There is a cost to God's love. Did you realize that? There is a, there is a literal cost, and it is not in monetary dollars. It is something that God has chosen to love you. A creation made in his image. He chose to love you. Now, God cares for the world. God cares for the trees. I think God cares for the cows. And God cares for the little squirrels and the little birds, right? But God doesn't send his son for the birds or for the squirrels or the cows. He sends his son for you. He give his image to you. I, I mean, I don't see any kind of uh, squirrel or, 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 or anything in the woods. I've sat in the woods a little bit and... And, and, and probably need to do more of that. But I've never seen a squirrel come up and hand me a book about God. Or a song about the Lord. You are created to do those things. You're created to write, to build, to love, to go, right? You're created in God's image to do those things. And God loves you. There's a cost to it. See, God, knew, God knows that there's a cost to this love. It's not that God just says, well, he's going to love the world. And then it kind of slipped up. Oh, I didn't see that one coming. I, I, didn't, I didn't know that I was, my love was going to cost me. God knew, and God knows this, the moment that he creates mankind. I'm going to give my spirit to them, and I'm going to love them, and they're going to break my heart, and I'm going to have to send, I'm going to send my son to redeem them. Understand this, God did not have to send Jesus for us. He could have said, hey, look, they're created and they morally failed and I'm going to send them off and I'm going to banish them and, 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 and that'll be forgotten. And God would have been totally just to have done that. But God chose to act and to say, you know what? I'm going to give this person, although they don't understand what it's like, they have no clue what it's like, I'm going to give them a chance to spend time with me. I'm going to give them a chance. So, the cost of God, love for you. The love of God is hard to understand. It is, it is definitely hard to measure. And it's not based on what you do for him. It is totally based on God and him alone. But understand this. We're not looking on the basis of God's love. We're looking at the way God loved today. The way that he loved you. When we think about the love of God, most of the time, we think about a verse. We think about John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We, that's what I think. I don't know about you, but when I think about the love of God, that's one of the first things that come to my mind, John 3, 16. And that we usually emphasize the gave in there, that he gave his only son so there's two things that we say god did that right he gave and his only son if the bible is only begotten or or, or something so we think and we we say god had god had one son he he gave the son and he gave it didn't he didn't have to you know trade it was not a barter going on he gave his son so we usually emphasize that those things are true but but giving christ is only a portion of his love See, God gave us Christ for the purpose of redemption, not merely to come live a good moral life, which Jesus did. God gave Christ for redemption, not only just to live a good moral life, but there's an, there's an element to that, that he's our pattern and he's our model and what Jesus did, we, we follow that. But understand this, God gave Jesus to us to bruise him, to bruise him. See, in the preceding verses in verse 10, when we, when we look above verse 10, and he says, there's no deceit found in his mouth. There's nothing going on in Jesus 
that's worthy of condemning him. There's nothing going on there in verse 9 that says, okay, Jesus or him deserved death. Yet it says, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now, how many of y'all been in a store sometime? And you've seen that little seven-year-old, maybe five-year-old little boy. And he's kicking his mom. And then he says something. Maybe he pulls her hair. And you think, boy, I'd take that one and light him up. Right? And for a slight second, you can apply verse 10. It pleased me to bruise him, right? I mean, you wouldn't do it, but if they offered a chance, you'd be like, yeah, let's go. I'm, I'm with you, right? <laughs> Mom, you come on. We're doing it, right? Go back out of Target and just take this kid, right? So I'm just saying, there's, there's a, because he kind of deserves it in that minute, right? He's pulling on her hair. He's yanking this leg. And I'm like, man, that's tough, right? But there's nothing found in Christ that deserves to be beaten. Nothing. There's no deceit. There's nothing coming from his tongue. There's no, there's no action. There's no thought. Christ literally brought God to earth and found no deceit in him. He is fully God. And we know he doesn't sin. So Christ had a mission to pay for sin with his life. And verse 10 says that it was pleasing to God the Father to bruise him. It was pleasing to God the Father to bruise him. But Christ was more than just bruised. He was beaten. He was more than just beaten. He died. And the overall point here, verse 10, is that the Father, it pleased the Father to have the Son suffer for you. It, it pleased the Father to have the Son suffer for you. To save you. Now understand this. The suffering of Jesus was unjustified. But it wasn't pointless. It wasn't meaningless. The suffering of Jesus, the weight of, the, the, the weight of sin put on him, he didn't deserve that. He didn't deserve that. He didn't deserve to be beaten. He didn't deserve to have to die. He didn't deserve, that's unjustified. But understand this. It's not pointless. It's not pointless because the suffering of Jesus allows you to have a chance at a, at a life outside of sin. Let, let me tell you this. If you think it's bad here, if you think it's bad now, you're like, boy, I tell you what, the world's bad, right? You look around, and usually we, don't, we never look in the mirror <laughs> and say that. <laughs> we never look in the mirror. We never go to the, to the restroom, look in the bathroom, or our home. Boy, the world's bad. Man, just look at me, right? We always look outward. We're reading the paper. We're reading whatever news and Fox News, Tri-Cities News, and we're like, man, whew, man, the world's gone crazy, right? The world's bad. And we look at outward and say that, but I'm just telling you, we need to take a look at the mirror and say, the world really is crazy. The world's bad. And if you think it's bad here, just try living without the goodness of God in this world. What am, I what am I saying? See, if we extract the goodness of God out of this world, His Spirit, then we don't have any good thing left. Only we have is me and you full of sin. Wow. I'm just telling you what. The world full of sin is really a picture, a slice of hell. I mean, I mean, we're just left to me and you and what we do to each other. And, and we'll, the Bible says in Proverbs, for a piece of bread, not a loaf of bread, a piece of bread, a man will transgress or a man will sin. For a piece of bread. And so we, we will do anything to justify our actions. We lie. We cheat. We steal. Yet, it pleased the Father to bruise him for you. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. I, I, I can't, that's what I'm saying. I, I, this is some of the hardest verses in the Bible to, for us to fully understand. But if God doesn't love you, explain verse 10 to me. 
Let's see, I'm just saying, God's not setting up. You may think God's distance. You may think he's so far away, I can't achieve that. But understand this. If God doesn't love you, explain verse 10. How else do you bruise the prize of heaven for redemption of sin if you don't love those that you're sending him to redeem? He loves you. He loves you. It's not that you're worth it, but it's that His glory, and for you to know His love, He sent Christ to pay for your sin. Understand it. We think we know God, but we really don't. I mean, we, we know Him in person, but we don't know the depths of Him until we look at the sacrifice of Christ. I'm telling you, God loves you. It's a reason He bruised Jesus. But I don't, still don't fully understand how he could love me. See, when we think about how tough the world is and how pe- mean people might be or how crazy life can get, we need to remember that God loved you enough to bruise his only son. God, God, God desires to have you with him, so he bruised his son. Also in verse 10, I want to point out this prophetic event is given to us. There's a prophetic event right here. He says, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. Not only would it please the Lord to bruise him, but it says he shall see his seed. How in the world can you see the seed of one that you bruised? Resurrection. Resurrection. We understand this. This is a glimmer. It's not a full picture. It's just a glimmer. It's a, it's a shiny spot. And we go, wait a minute. I need to pause and I need to think about that. Isaiah is saying 700 years prior to the death of Christ, and the resurrection here, he shall see his seed. That the Father shall see his seed. The one that we put in the ground will rise from the grave. Amen. Man. See, God gave Christ the authority to come up from the grave after death. So the Romans said, no, 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 we're going to put a stone in front of that. And we're going to put a bunch of soldiers outside. That's man's way of trying to control God, right? A large rock and a bunch of soldiers with knives. I mean, it's kind of, when you think about that, you think, well, we really are dumb, aren't we? I mean, we're trying to control God by putting his son in a hole and, and guarding him, sending men to guard him. Listen, it, 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 if, if they had dug a pit to the center of the earth, filled it full of concrete, and put the whole world's army on top of it, he still would have rose from the dead. When I think about the cost of living, I think about the cost of the Father, and I say, God had a cost to loving you. The son's bruising. Not only is there a cost of the father, there's Christ that satisfies. Obedience always leads to God, being his glory being displayed. Remember that. Obedience always leads to the glory of God being displayed to those around you. Obedience always leads. So when Christ went to the cross, he knew these verses. And just think about that for just a second. If these verses are written 700 years prior to Christ, right? Obviously, Christ is, is authoring the. He knew these verses the day that he gets nailed to the cross. He knows this. He knows this. And when he went to the cross, he was completely obedient. And when men betrayed Jesus and rejected Jesus and killed Jesus, it was the permissible will of God. God allowed it to happen. Understand this, and as Christ fully accepted his role in redemption, the pain of knowing it would be a slow, lonely, slow death. Verse 11 says this, He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. So the Father sees Christ's work on the cross, and he's satisfied what did jesus say on the cross one of the last things he said to tell us die paid in full it's paid for it is finished right why did he say that because it is redemption was paid for and so christ is saying it's paid for 
I paid for you. It is finished. And the father sees this in verse 11 and says, I am satisfied with the work my son has done. Now understand this. Jesus could have come and live and live forever. But his death paid for sin. His death paid for sin because his life was full of righteousness. So you had to have the life of Christ and the death of Christ. But when you mix those two together, man, you get justification when you believe. Understand this. It's an opportunity for you to believe. The most satisfied God has been in a time is when Christ died for you. I don't know that there's a time that God has not been more satisfied. I don't know that there's a time when, when there's not a father more proud of his son is than when Jesus was bruised for you. God sent Christ to die. And verse 11 says... He is servant justified many. That the servant justified many. Let me tell you something. I, I cannot save you. I can't justify you. I cannot, I cannot sit down and say, hey, look, what, what are the sins that you've done? And you name them all to me, even if you knew them all. And I say, okay, I'm going to die and pay for this. Or I'm going to help you get over these. I cannot justify you. I can point you to the one that justifies. But only Jesus, only him justifies sinners that's the reason they say that no other name is given among men where we find salvation because only jesus has died for you only he has the perfect life can do that in first john chapter 2 verse 2 it says and he himself is the propitiation for our sins that means the payment that means the the installment he is the propitiation for our sins and not only for ours only but also for the whole world so we understand as, as John writes this, he's a Jewish man. He says, not only for our sins, the Jewish sins, but the sins of the whole world from every tribe, from every continent, from every ocean, from every place, that Christ died for men and women. Christ came for you. You know the name of John Harper? You ever heard of John Harper? He was a pastor in England in the early, late 1800s and early 1900s. He pastored two churches in uh, Glasgow and in London. And John Harper had been invited to go to Chicago to preach. And obviously that is before the airplane. And so he gets on a boat. And he's going to Chicago to preach at the famous evangelist church of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody. If you don't know the life of D.L. Moody, I suggest you maybe search that and look that up. Famous evangelist, had a huge church and following in Chicago and um, was, was just, uh, just a great leader. And um, in fact, D.L. Moody had since passed and he was, John Harper was going to be the next pastor at Moody Church. And so he had... Lost his wife some years prior. John Harper had a six-year-old daughter. And they boarded a boat to leave England for America. The year was 1912. The only problem is, and in God's sovereignty, this is what he did, is that John Harper boarded the Titanic. So John Harper boarded the Titanic in his party. They hit the iceberg. He put his daughter in a lifeboat. He set his daughter in a lifeboat. And then he went around and started witnessing to everybody that he could find. Do you know Christ? Do you know Christ? Our time is short. Do you know Christ? So he would witness from person to person to person. He went up to an officer. And he, would, he, he, he asked the officer. He said, do you know Christ? This man was an officer on the Titanic. And he said, no, I don't know Christ. And I don't care too. I got too much going on. And he begged the man to know Christ. And the, and the man said, I don't need Christ. Or the man said, no, I don't. And, and John Harper took off his life jacket and gave it to this officer. He said, you need this more than I do then. Once the boat sank, they're in the water. Those lifeboats are full and they're in the water. They're trying to find debris to swim on. And, and he would swim from person to person, asking them if they knew Christ Asking them, 
Do you know Christ? Accept Christ right now. Do you believe in Christ? Have you ever met Christ? Do you have a relationship with Christ? John Harper would swim from person to person to person. He began to get hypothermia as he was in the water, and it was freezing. He went around to one person, one young man, and the, and the young man refused to receive the invitation to believe in Christ. So John Harper swam, and he was making rounds, and he swam back around and met the man again. And this story was told at a Titanic survivors meeting up in Canada later, many years later. The second time John Harper came around, the man received Christ. He trusted Christ. And then he saw John Harper slip into the water and not come back up. He said, as far as I know, I'm the last convert that John Harper had a chance to witness to. That man's legacy lived on through that man that said yes to Christ. So why would a man give his life for others? Why would John Harper, a widow, could have got on the lifeboat with his six-year-old daughter? Why did he forfeit that? Why did he give his life jacket away? Why, why would he do those things? Why, why, would he, why would he swim from person to person out here in frigid water knowing he's going to die? Witnessing to people. People that he didn't even know. He had probably never met before that trip. People total strangers. He's swimming from person to person. Why would he do that to offer salvation? Because he believed that Christ was the only way to God. Out of eternity, peace with God. Just as Christ, just as John Harper gave his life that night so that people could come to have an opportunity to, change, to, to, to know Christ, so Christ died for you. But see, Christ is much different than John Harper. Is that Christ knows you. Christ knows you. Christ knows everything good about you and everything bad about you. Yet, he left eternity, a much worse condition, and to come into this earth and, and died for you. Much worse in the frigid waters and in the Atlantic Ocean. Much worse condition. But the problem is, as many of us are swimming in the same water saying, well, I don't see any issue with this. I, I don't find any problem out here. And Christ has come, and he's come to die so that you could have a chance to get out of this problem because the days are few, yet we're swimming in frigid water saying, I, I think we're perfectly fine. There'll probably be a boat by any time. Time is short. The days are few. You cannot control, listen to me, what everybody else believes around you. You must deal with Christ individually. He died for sinners one time for all. But you must believe in Christ individually. Your friends can't do it for you. Your parents can't do it for you. Your, your children can't do it that for you. You must come to Christ individually. Because you die individually. You sin individually. He will pay for your sin. He'll justify you. He'll become your father. He'll become your best friend. He'll become your savior. He is your brother. Christ literally changes Everything about you when he comes in. The last thing I would point out is there's a celebration to come. When we think of the end of life, we usually think of heaven. But verse 12 says he will divide the spoil of the strong. We understand this as Christ enjoying those who have chosen to believe in him. You are the spoil. You are the spoil. You are the ones that believe in him. And when you come, he will enjoy you Forever. Verse 12 says that he was numbered with the transgressors. Christ died between two thieves. But also he died as sin. He died as a sinner. He was numbered. And he was belonging to that. But God the Father saw Christ as sin on the cross. And me full of sin. So that only he could pay for my sin. Oh yeah. I'm telling you right now. There was a cost to the Father's love. There's this Christ that satisfies, but because he's got satisfaction, there's a celebration yet to come.
there is a celebration yet to come. From what I can see in heaven, it is that Christ is celebrated, is celebrated forever. That we celebrate the death of Christ. That we celebrate his life for us. That we celebrate God's love for us. Listen, you don't have to manufacture happiness. You know Jesus and you receive joy. I don't know about you, but I need some joy in my life. Amen? I need, this world needs joy. What better way to find that? What better, what better way to find hope is to know Jesus Christ who has died to justify me. Like I said, I would rather have Jesus pay for my sin in his death than me enter eternity and be paid for my sin for all eternity. I need to remember that. And God's got us on a mission too. We might not get the opportunity to swim in the Arctic Ocean frigid witnessing to people, but God has just as important message for us on Monday to share with the UPS driver, with our friend at, at, that lives across the street, or our buddy that we work with or golf with. God has just as important information and message today for us to share. We need to get, think about that. We need to make sure that we're right with God and that we're pleasing in his sight. God doesn't have to send Jesus to be bruised anymore. That's finished. But he sent us into a world as sheep among wolves. Father, I thank you.